Welcome everyone. Thanks very much for joining us for this seminar, Cabling for AV Systems. Today's presentation will be delivered by Mike Novak, AV Product Manager, with our sponsor company, Panduit. We thank Panduit very much for making this seminar possible through their sponsorship. And we also thank Mike for putting together the information that you'll see today. And just to briefly give you a preview of Mike's agenda, he'll discuss it, of course, in much more detail, but he's going to talk about uh, chipset technologies, HD Base T, AV over IP, uh, similar technologies, all with an eye on the cabling implications of established, new, and emerging AV technologies. You can submit questions anytime throughout the seminar. When Mike has completed his presentation, we'll have a Q&A with him to wrap up. If you hold a Bixi credential, then you earn a continuing education credit toward the renewal of that credential by attending this seminar. Before we sign off, I'll explain how we will send to you an attendance certificate. That'll be good for that CEC. For now though, I thank you once again for joining us and I'm pleased to turn it over to today's presenter, Mike Novak. Thanks, Patrick. Again, my name is Mike Novak. I am a product manager at Panduit Corporation. Uh, my, speci my speciality is audiovisual uh, infrastructure systems and today we'll be talking about cabling for AV. So just a quick review, and Patrick kind of touched on this already, but we will review some uh, basics of what HD Base-T and AV over IP are. Uh, additionally, we'll jump into those chipset technologies and then get into the considerations and recommendations that we would see for HD Base-T as well as AV over IP. But as I like to start most of my presentations, um, Fun facts are always good and relevant in the workplace, right? So the first one, in 2005, tech workplaces dedicated 89% of space to individual desks. Um, today, that number is plummeted to 25%. What that means is that uh, the individual desk space is going away and being replaced with different things. Um, collaboration spaces and huddle spaces are really becoming the social norm in the workplace, um, and your audiovisual needs for those products uh, are really growing. Um, the second one is 93% uh, of educators say that video improves the learning experience. Similar to how you might view YouTube and uh, learning things on YouTube, um, in the education space, you also see a growth and a need for audiovisual signals in those environments. And last but not least, um, the related to week two of the preseason for the NFL, uh, CBS Broadcast Network, uh, used 8K cameras for Super Bowl 53 that was played in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium uh, down in Atlanta in February. Why is this important? Because today we talk about how 4K is coming of age, but even in February we see major broadcast networks using advanced technologies to bring even higher resolution uh, products out to the market. So let's talk about HD Base-T, give you a quick refresher. Um, what is HD Base-T? It is a standard for signal extension over category cable. Um, it is a point-to-point -point connection system, and it is used in about 70% of AV installations today. There are, uh, the way you look at HD Base-T is, in this example, I have it in its simplest form, uh, a source on the top left side, which would be a laptop, and a display on the bottom right. And I want to connect these two devices together so that I can extend that AV signal. So how do I do that with an HD base T system? Well first, I would take my HDMI cable out of my source, in this case being the laptop, and I would hook it up right to the, uh, what we call a transmitter. That transmitter takes the native HDMI cable and converts it into an HD base T signal. From that transmitter, that HD base T signal gets sent over category cable up to 100 meters. Um, and you get more than just the audio video signal that's sent through this. Um, in regards to HD base T, we call it the five play, um, and five play gives you audio video uh, signal extension of 4K, uh, 100 meg of ethernet, uh, 100 watts of power, RS-232 and IR control, as well as USB 2.0 uh, pass through for USB peripheral devices. So now I'm sending this uh, this max amount of data over a standard category cable and it's HD base T. From there, I'll convert it back from HD base T into a standard native HDMI signal and simply connect that HDMI cable into the display. That in a nutshell is the simplest form of HD base T. 
So what are the, some of the advantages and limitations of HD-based T that, are, um, that exist today? So some of the advantages, 4K video support, HD-based T and the HD-based T 2.0 standard give you good uh, support for 4K uh, 4 420 signal at 60 hertz uh, refresh rates for video support. Secondly, HD-based T is low latency. Um, the signal itself is not, uh, there is no latency within the signal. There's, uh, you're talking eight to less than eight milliseconds worth of latency passed along the HD base T signal. We briefly talked about five play in the previous slide. Um, that is a major advantage to what HD base T's capabilities are for signal extension beyond just that audio visual signal. And finally, HD base T, as I had said, is used in about 70% of in AV installations today. Um, it is a widely adopted technology uh, that's out there in the marketplace, and you'll see it every day. Some of the limitations of HD base T, uh, low interoperability. What we mean by low interoperability is that manufacturers of different HD base T extenders, um, you can't use transmitters and receivers intermixed. Usually you're using one manufacturer's transmitters and receivers at any point in time, um, and you cannot intermix them, which can create a little bit of havoc uh, if, you're not, if you're running with different manufacturers on each side of that point-to-point -point connection. HDBC also requires a separate infrastructure, uh, different from your standard network. Um, it is, as I said, it's a point-to-point -point connection, um, so you legitimately have one cable that goes between those two devices, uh, and there's no connection back to your standard network uh, for a signal pass-through. Distance limitations. Uh, HDBC runs on a 100-meter channel, and as we get into more of the chipset technologies, you'll see that that number can be even more limited depending on what your um, depending on what you're using. And then finally, another limitation of HD base T would be a fixed number of devices. As you get into more complex installations and using uh, HD base T matrix switches, you might have a finite number of inputs to outputs, uh, say on an eight input, eight output matrix switcher. The second you want to add another source and or another display to that matrix switcher, you have to go out and replace that entire piece of equipment. Um, with other with other technologies such as AV over IP, you'll see that that limitation is actually overcome. Speaking of AV over IP, um, let's get into what AV over IP looks at at its simplest form. So AV over IP, audio video over internet protocol, um, essentially I want to do the same thing. I want to extend that uh, AV signal beyond 12 to 15 feet um, and go from a source to a display. And in this case, it looks somewhat similar to HD base T, but there are differences between the two. So first, in order to get this channel to work, I go from an HDMI cable into an encoder out of my source. That encoder then goes and converts that signal from HDMI to standard ethernet packets and standard ethernet. From there, I have the ability to take that signal and run it over standard 100 meter, a standard 100 meter channel of category cable and connect it to my network. Once I'm connect, connected to my network, and that being a local area network or a WAN connection, um, I can route that signal wherever I need to go. Coming out of that network and to the decoder side, um, what happens is I would use, I would connect to that switch in the network in that TR closet. I could run up to 100 meters of uh, my category cable into the decoder. That decoder then uses um, what it does is transmits that signal from Ethernet IP back into a native HDMI signal, and I would be taking that HDMI signal into the display. Again, in its simplest form, um, that is what AV over IP looks to accomplish. So what are some of the advantages and limitations of AV over IP? So a lot of advantages and a few limitations, and we'll talk about that. As far as advantages go, scalable switching and better ratio of inputs to outputs. Um, as I had talked about the matrix switcher on the HD base T side having finite connections, when I look to scale an AV over IP connection, I simply need one encoder for each source connected to my network. Uh, similarly, on the display side, if I want to increase the amount of displays that I would have in an installation, I simply would be adding a decoder that would connect to the network. And I can stream signals as, as any ratio to any ratio that I want. So if I have for example, one source that I want to push to 15 displays, I would need one encoder and 15 decoders, and you're good to go. 
The next one is breaking distance barriers. As you are connected to the network, you overcome the limitation of a 100 meter point to point connection system that you would see with HD base T. Once I'm connected to my network, I can go 100 meters to wherever I need to go on either end um, from a source or a display. Convergence with data and communications is all about the AV signal being on your standard network and the data that's within there um, going over the same network that all of your other, uh, net, uh, your enterprise applications data would be pushing through. And then finally, um, there are several advantages uh, and new options for video processing of AV over IP that we'll get into a little bit in regards to uh, protocols. Um, but the, by far and large, with the uptake of AV over IP, uh, those improvements to video processing are, are short of none. Limitations, so one gigabit compressed signals, again, kind of, it is a limitation, uh, but mostly on the processor side of what you see on an encoder and decoder signal. I will be taking a very hefty connection, or a very heavy gigabit connection and reducing that down to get it into a standard one gig network. Um, but of that, you could see some signal loss, but with the video processing not, uh, that's been improved, not really a major limitation. And finally, IT configuration and setup. Not necessarily a major limitation, um, but something to consider because it is different than an HD base T network where I'm just running a point-to-point -point connection. Now I have to worry about how my switch is configured, if I have to set up separate VLANs um, in order to make sure that I'm routing my network traffic appropriately. Um, it is a new consideration that AV over IP brings to the, the market. So that's our, that's our quick refresher course. Let's step into a little bit of the technologies. So I said we're going to talk about chipsets. We'll talk specifically about HD base T right here. So there are five different chipset classes for HD base T, um, class A through class E. And the three that you see on the screen in front of you are probably the three most used chipsets that exist in the market today. So let's take a look at class A chipsets. Um, class A chipsets support that five play uh, capability. Um, and what it gives you is different resolutions and different distances for different categories of cable. So on the chart, you'll see 4K resolution, 70 meters at over cap IV for class A chipsets. If you downscale that resolution, you're able to 1080p, you're able to extend that signal 30 meters over that same cap IV cable. In regards to class B chipsets, um, you get, there is more limitations placed upon you when it comes to an installation. Class B chipsets are typically used um, as a lower cost uh, to uh, in the environment. And so you'll see that 4K limitation really drawn back. Um, so you'll see 4K 35 meters over a cat 5D cable. And then if you again downscale that resolution to 1080p, you can increase from 35 to 70 meters um, with the addition of improving your cable, your cable bandwidth from cat 5D to cat 6A. The Class C chipset is a newer chipset that you see out there. HDBC 2.0 supports five play capabilities. Um, and in this case, you'll see a 4K resolution being passed 90 meters over a cap 5E cable. Um, additionally, to go that full 100 meters, as long as you scale up to a cat 6 a cable, you can get the same resolution and that additional 10 meters of length that you're looking for with Class C chipsets. So that's a lot, why is it important to you? Um, a lot of manufacturers, don't actually call out chipset technologies that are within their HD base T infrastructures uh, or their HD base T extenders, but rather um, they will call out different uh, distance limitations for categories of cable in a different way. So let's take a look at this. Um, Avona, a AV company that Panduit purchased back in January, offers HD base T extenders, and you'll see that in this chart that they call out different. Uh, different lengths and different ranges for the different resolutions of cables that they have for their extenders. So on the left hand side you'll see that a 1080p, uh, a 1080p resolution over a cap IV cable will give you 60 meters of distance, uh, whereas that 4K signal at a cat 6 a cable gives you 40 meters of distance. Conversely, on the right-hand side, and as you scale throughout this uh, example, on the right-hand side, you'll see that a, a different chipset might be used in this 100-meter 
uh, extender that can send a 100 meters of a 1080p signal over a cap IV cable, as well as a 100 meters of signal for a 4K resolution for a CAT 6A signal. So it's important that when you're looking into installing HD base C extenders or selecting them or specifying them, that you're really taking a look at the true application uh, and the true distance that you're trying to go with different sets of uh, cables and extenders. Flipping over to AV over IP, um, that you'll, the distance limitation is really not there because you're working over a standard uh, IP protocol. So in regards to HDMI 2.0 signal, you are running that um, an HDMI 2.0 signal at 4K resolution, 60 hertz 444, rolls in at about 16 or 18 gigabits worth of bandwidth. Um, the important part on this is that because I'm driving to a standard IP protocol, I need to compress that signal to fit in the standard uh, networking channels that we have today. The first step of this is looking at compressing to a 10 gigabit signal. SDVOE, or Software Defined Video over Ethernet, is a compression, um, an alliance that talks about compression for 10K, I'm sorry, 10 gigabit uh, transmission. 10 gigabit transmission seems like a good opportunity um, for people to compress signal. However, it can be incredibly costly. Some of the areas where you absolutely need this are uh, military applications and medical applications. And the reason why you might need a 10 gig compression as opposed to a 1 gig compression is because of things like latency. SDVOE has a very low level of latency, um, less than eight milliseconds, and in some case, uh, uncompressed uh, and no latency whatsoever. Um, the most of us in the rest of the world might be moving down to a one gigabit compression protocol, um, which gives you an increased amount of latency on your, on your uh, connection. So you'll see the three down here, H.264, JPEG 2000, and SMPTE, or the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, um, ST2110, are three different protocols that give you the ability to compress your signals from uh, 18 gigabits to one gigabit and sending those over standard CAT 5E and CAT 6 cable. There are variations of these guys um, as opposed to what you see with HDBase T. And those variations uh, allow different levels of compression as well as different levels of latency within them. Um, from, top, from bottom to top, H.264 has gives you about 30 plus milliseconds of latency. JPEG 2000 kind of halves that at, at 16 milliseconds of latency, and SMPTE will fall at about eight milliseconds of latency, similar to what you see with SDVOE. As far as technologies go, uh, in, in regards to cable classes, most of you are familiar with the chart that I'm showing in front of you. Um, but what's important to note is the differences between bandwidth, uh, as well as insertion loss. In regards to bandwidth, uh, CAT6 and CAT6A cable, you know that you're scaling from 250 megahertz to 500 megahertz. Um, but one of the things I did want to point out is that when you scale from CAT6A to potentially a CAT7 cable, which is somewhat familiar in the pro AV world, you're only getting about 100 megahertz of additional bandwidth. One of the things that Panduit's found at the Enterprise Applications Research Lab that looks into understanding category cable and its effects on AV trans signal transmission is that insertion loss has a very important effect on the quality of HD based T signals pushed through it. So when you look at CAT6 versus CAT6A versus CAT7 in regards to insertion loss, you want to you want to be able to minimize that number. Um, and the differences between a CAT6A and a CAT7 cable are negligible in that effect. Something also to, to note on this is that PoE support across all these cables um, is, ex does exist and is there today. Talking about PoE, um, one of the things we like to look at is PoE type 3 and type 4 and how those, the standards for PoE type 3 and type 4 have really raised the amount of power that can be sent uh, through a category cable. Uh, similarly to the considerations that you would make for type 3 and type 4 PoE, the same considerations you would be making for HD-based T. HD-based T, as we said, pulls 100 watts of power. 
Um, and those considerations such as bundle size um, and heat dissipation are really important factors that you should also consider uh, like you would a normal type 3, type 4 PoE connection. So if we take some model data from TSB 184, we see that temperature rise and bundle size is something that we, we would consider to look at. Um, category 6A cable, as compared to just uh, CAT 5E cable, has a better um, heat dissipation for heat rise in a bundle than, um, than a CAT 5E cable. Additionally, when you look at foiled cables, uh, CAT 6A foiled cables, they even dissipate more heat than a standard CAT 6A UTC cable would be as well. So if you have PoE uh, connections with HD base T and you're running that 100 watts of power, it's important to denote your cable size, and this would be a consideration you would make for HD base T uh, cable selection. So that's a little bit of the refreshers and, and, and a lot of the technologies that you see today. What do you hear in the marketplace? What's important? Um, what do different people say? So HD base T infrastructure, what does the HD base T alliance say? Uh, by far and large, they say a CAT 5V cable is all you need for signal extension. If you're considering bundling CAT 6, even CAT 6A would be a good option for you. Um, but then you look at different manufacturers, and different manufacturers say different things. Uh, CAT 5V cables can be acceptable, CAT 6, CAT 6A cables. You'll hear CAT 7 and CAT 7A cables as well. In some cases, uh, proprietary cables are what is required for you to get a certification to get a warranty for an extender set. Um, is that really the best option? So we did a little bit of testing at our Enterprise Application Research Lab in order to kind of investigate this a little bit further. The first test you see here is uh, on the right-hand side, there's a quantum data tester that tests, that tests uh, 70 meters of cable uh, of HD base T signal being pushed through it. What we did is we ran four different tests that roll through 4K signal transmission as well as two tests for 1080p signal transmission over 70 meters. And we looked at different cables such as CAT6 UUTP, CAT6 FUTP, CAT6 A UUTP, and CAT6 A FUTP cables and looked at the amount of errors that you would get when sending an HD base C connection over 70 meters for this cable. What we found is exactly what you see in the charts is that for um, CAT6 cables and the CAT 6A FUTP cable, there were absolutely no pixel drops and no errors um, within, these, within these tests. Uh, CAT 6A UTP cable did have some pixel drops, um, but they were incredibly negligible compared to um, what you would see in a normal real life application. So for every 4,000 frames, we're looking at about 40 pixel drops, uh, which is uh, something that wouldn't even be noticeable to the human eye by any stretch of the imagination. So that's cool. We wanted to bump this test up even more and kind of take it to the next level, and, and we did. So what we wanted to do was test those same cables over longer distances and see what the difference between these cables are again. Um, and by far, by far and large, you do see more pixel drops uh, at 100 meter lengths over all four of these cables. Um, but on average, the CAT 6A UTP cable performs better than CAT 6A that performs better than CAT 6 UTP cables um, out there. Again, what's interesting about this is that even though those pixel drops ranges are about 250 to even 300, it's not something that becomes noticeable to the human eye. Your visual defects across these cables are not um, recognizable. But is it really the whole story? So yes, we can test an HD base connection over a category cable and say, does this work, does it not? Um, but we have to look at what the concept is when you're actually using an HD base, key, HD, HD base T connection. And that includes including the extenders that would be on either end of these cables. Um, they technically are a part of your infrastructure when it comes to connecting your endpoint devices. So we even expanded upon that test even one more time and we moved from four cables to 10 cables, and we moved from four different video modes to be tested to six different video modes to be tested, all running 4,000 frames um, to, to look for errors within these cables as it's sent over those channels. And at 100 meter lengths, uh, the chart tells itself there aren't any defects on cables. 
And what does that really tell us is that active devices are an extension of the signal channel and that when you pair good cabling infrastructure, whether it be CAT6, CAT6A, um, and good active devices, you will not have problems with your AV signal transmission. If you pair um, a marginal active device with a good quality cable in, cabling infrastructure, you would get marginal performance. Your, your products, um, similar to how you would see a standard category channel, um, would the, the, the part that has the least performance is the performance that you get over the entire channel. So as you improve that overall, um, from the cable side and from the active device side, you won't have any issues whatsoever. So here's a good question. Do I need a shielded cable? Because we haven't really talked about that yet, but I'm sure it's on your mind. Um, at Panduit, the answer could really be no or yes. Um, I think we would, we would slide towards saying the answer could be no. Um, there are considerations that you need to make when looking at whether or not I should or should not be using a shielded cable. As you saw on the previous slide, um, when I'm using good infrastructure, whether it be a UTP cable or a, or a uh, FUTP cable, um, there isn't any performance difference when I, when I pair that with a good quality HD base T extender. But some considerations you might want to make. If I have to bundle cables and uh, I'm in a noisy environment, uh, those are two considerations. I, if I don't have those things to worry about, I might not need to use a shielded cable. Um, if I want to have a faster installation time or if I want to pay a 20 to 40 percent lower price point um, or if I don't want to carry additional cables for an installation and I want to simplify what I have, um, those would be considerations why I might not need a shielded cable. Why the answer could be yes um, is because you have to bundle those cables and you have to have the best alien crosstalk performance in the industry. Um, additionally, if you are in a noisy environment, um, that might be a consideration to why I would need to use a shielded cable. But the disclaimer on this is that those shielded cables have to be pop properly bonded and grounded throughout the entire solution. Um, if they are not, you can actually hinder the performance of that shielded cable to be worse than a standard UTP cable in that same environment. Uh, also, take into consideration on the UTP cable side that there are foiled cables out there that offer um, just as good uh, alien crosstalk performance and EMI immunity uh, as a shielded cable could as well. So, what are my considerations? In an article published uh, last, last week on CINM, my coworker Amy Hacker had written an article about considering the ABCs of cabling. And that's really one of the things that we want to want to share with you. Look at your application bandwidth connectors distance and EMI in regards to your um, in regards to that installation. When I'm looking at applications, am I looking for HD base T? Am I looking for an AV over IP application? Um, what are the differences that I might want to make? What does the signal extension look like? Secondly, bandwidth. Do I have to have that 4K resolution or do I only need a 1080p resolution? Uh, connectors, when I look at extending channels, do I have to have a good quality connector um, that runs throughout? Um, and then additionally, do I need to look at things such as a field terminable plug or a modulated, modular plug terminated link uh, to be able to share with, those, uh, with that channel? Distance, do I have to go a full 100 meters or do I have to go less than 100 meters? Most environments, I would say, you're probably not going to use that full 100 meter distance uh, when you're looking at a conference room or a huddle space. And then lastly, are you in that noisy environment? Do you have to have that EMI protection? Factors that influence this. If you're working with your customers and seeing uh, or hearing these things, this might be considerations for why you would go one way or another. If I have to have that 4K UHD resolution, um, if I have to have capabilities for PoE, if I need to bundle cables, and if I am or am not in that noisy environment, um, I, those are all considerations that I would make for a recommendation for a CAT6A cable. So the recommendation from Panduit, CAT6A um, gives you 10 gig performance. Uh, CAT6A gives you better performance against the alien crosstalk when talking about bundling cables for HD base T uh, infrastructure. And as well, as long as you're using a foiled cable, it gives you good EMI immunity 
Um, so you don't have to worry about those noisy environments as much. In regards to AV over IP, the conversation actually becomes a lot simpler. Um, AV over IP follows, as we had said, follows standard uh, networking specifications, and that's what really drives all this to be much simpler. Uh, ANSI TIA 568-2, our .2-D, um, and power over Ethernet, IEEE 802.3 and the TS, the technical service bulletin, are really the things that you should follow in regards to looking at what your standard uh, network specifications would be. So the considerations that you would make for HD, uh, I'm sorry, for AV over IP are actually really the same um, in regards to the selection. So consider, again, your ABCs of cabling. What is the application? In this case, you're, you're looking at AV over IP. Um, and then from there, I have my bandwidth, my connectors, distance, and EMI as we had previously talked through. The factors that would influence this, again, 4K UHD resolution. Do I have to have the best of the best signal, or am I only looking to pass a 1080p signal here? Um, what amount of latency is acceptable to the customer? Do I have to have something that is really meant for that military and or medical application, or am I in a conference room where I would be just using a, uh, a display to show a spreadsheet or uh, a website or something of that nature? Um, those two things really drive the bandwidth requirement that you might or might not need as well. Um, and, then, and then lastly, the PoE capabilities. Um, do you have to have PoE? Are you going to be sending that 100 watts of power um, or not? So our recommendation for those things would be follow your standard networking uh, considerations that you would make for looking at uh, AV over IP installations. Some of the future considerations that you might want to make or just things to think about, trends that you see in the industry, um, we'll just run through them right here. So the need for high quality AV is growing. Um, 4K, as we had talked earlier, is uh, fast approaching. Um, 8K is already following, as we had talked about with, with uh, the CBS and the Super Bowl. Um, AV over IP is growing rapidly. Uh, ourselves included see that the transition from HDBC to AV over IP is growing at a, a somewhat alarming rate, um, but you'll see many manufacturers kind of hopping on the train, the pro AV manufacturers hopping on the train of AV over IP, really getting involved into the convergence of what the AV IT world is. Um, and lastly, uh, huddle spaces are the new conference rooms. So we had talked about how cube space is shrinking and cube space is turning into something different. The same is really true for conference rooms. When you have small spaces, uh, huddle spaces are really an area where three to five people can meet and discuss and really plug in um, and have no control but want to just simply show something um, at an ad hoc basis. Um, that is really what's starting to take over the, the conference room designs of, of yesterday. Um, so you'll see those audio-visual needs increasing because you have a smaller footprint. That means more displays, more HD base C extenders, um, more cable poles, and things of that nature. So finally, kind of summing it all up, um, though each AV application might have its own need, quality cabling infrastructure ensures that, ensures that your system has that best performance possible. And that cabling infrastructure extends beyond just the cables, but also to the HDBST extenders that you would be connecting to. When in doubt, or if you want to look at different considerations, follow your ABCs of cabling. Make sure that you are stepping through and making sure you're looking at all the considerations you need to make in order to select the right cable for your installation. For, as far as HDBST goes, our recommendation, a CAT6A cable, um, and as far as AV over IP application goes, follow the standard network specifications that you would need when making that selection. That's all I have today. Thank you very much for your time. Um, Patrick, I'll turn it back over to you for questions. Mike, thank you very much. Thanks for all that information. Thanks, of course, to the members of our audience who have tuned in and have submitted questions. We do have a few of them. Uh, I'm going to give Mike about one minute to um, to take a breath and maybe a drink of water before we get into Q&A. And in that time, I just want to let you know that if you are a Bixie professional credential holder, then uh, you 
will receive a continuing education credit for your attendance at this event. The, um, the caveat is that you stay on with us through Q&A until, uh, until we wrap up and sign off. Once we do that, we will send an email to you. Um, when you registered for today's seminar, you did so by providing an email address to us. That's the address where we will send a message back to you. That message will contain a link that will bring you to your personalized attendance certificate. It'll have your name on it. It'll have today's date. It'll have the, um, the title of this seminar, and it will have um, an identification code that Bixie will recognize for a continuing education credit. So that's, uh, that's how that will work. And um, again, that'll happen once we sign off and, uh, and the seminar is complete. But before we do that, uh, we are going to occupy some time with, um, with Q&A. Mike, do we, do we have you back? Because we do have a few questions lined up that might, yeah. uh, might take us uh, close to or near the top of the hour even, depending on uh, how the Q&A goes, uh, because we do sure. have a few of them. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Um, at, on your, your sum summary uh, slide here, uh, the final bullet point says you know, HD base T applications and your recommendation is category 6A. But early on in today's seminar, a question came in before you really got to that conclusion. A question came in, what is the minimum category of cable required for HD base T? So, so if we frame that, you know, differently, we understand the recommendation. But if, if, there's, a, uh, if there's an instance in which the objective or the requirement really is just to meet the baseline absolute minimum, you know, minimally compliant HD base T infrastructure. Is that, um, is there a, um, a specific category cabling that, that meets that requirement at its bare minimum? Yeah, so it really falls down into understanding um, the distance limitations uh, that you would be looking for for an HD base T extender. Typically, CAF IV, if you don't have to worry about cable bundling, um, and you're not worried about PoE implications, uh, things of that nature, um, CAF IV could suffice as a minimally compliant cable uh, to pass that signal. But as we had talked about with HD base T uh, chipsets that are out there, if, if the, it really falls down on the distance limitation of the chipset. So if you're going to try to send that you know, 4K signal 70 or 100 meters um, and the chipset cannot support it, over CAF IV, then you're not going to get that signal. So always look at manufacturer's recommendations, number one, when it comes to HD base T extenders. Um, and then two, consider things such as uh, cable bundling and uh, cable bundling and POE. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, different question, kind of in a um in a different uh, different realm, I guess, or, or, or uh, moving away from minimally compliant cable, uh, more to architecture. Attendee asks, where might the encoder decoder live? Would it live at the station side or does it reside in an equipment room or IDF? Yeah, so for AV over IP installations and looking at encoders and decoders, um, that source, it really can live uh, on the encoder side. Let's start there. On the encoder side, that source can really live anywhere. Um, typically speaking, we would see that in a TR room of some sort. So I have a, uh, maybe a media player or a laptop that would be in a TR room that would connect to that encoder um, because I can only go 12 to 15 feet on that HDMI cable. And then conversely, on the decoder side where I'm connecting that to a display, um, that would generally speaking live right behind the display either in some type of in-wall box or uh, maybe in a credenza that a display would, might be sitting on. Great, thank you. Uh, another question asks about uh, compression. And again, this, this question came in um, prior to your presenting uh, presentation of the slide that addressed compression, but I think nonetheless the, the question was kind of prescient because it, uh, uh, it addresses that uh, to some extent or asks about it. Um, question is, with compression, do you think that uh, you'll ever need more than a gig, uh, one gig capable network? Um, so, I mean, absolutely. As, as we get into the uh, higher levels of 4K signal transmission and then getting into 8K signal transmission, transmission maybe, you know, 5 five to eight years from now, or if not further along, 
Um, the need for a 10 gig network might absolutely be there. Um, I mean, even today it's needed for military and medical applications, right? So it, it comes down to the, answering the question of how much latency can an application accept, and then conversely, how much resolution um, would I need? Those two things determine what your bandwidth is, and if those two things are, is, if latency continues to be incredibly important and your, your resolution increases from 4K to 8K or a higher refresh rate, um, a 10 gig cable connection and a 10 gig network would absolutely be needed. Ah, thank you. Thanks very much. Another question um, asks about um, Atlona, the brand that, that is uh, on the slide in front of everybody right now, at, at Atlona, a, a Panduit company. Um, and not to turn this into a, um, you know, a, a five-minute commercial or anything, but Panduit earlier in 2019 acquired um, the, the, the company at Lona, um, as we reported on, and, and um, congratulations on that to the organization. But the question, um, from a very practical standpoint, asks, uh, is the at Lona product line or product portfolio sold in standard cabling distribution houses? And I think where they're coming from is... Uh, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a purchaser of Panduit products, and I know where I go for those. Can I get uh, Atlona product systems technologies from the same houses? Yes. So the, the answer to that question is where you would typically see Panduit products bought today, um, your major distribution warehouses. Um, one of the things that Panduit has done is work to make sure that we bring those products into those same areas. Um, so if you're familiar with the annexers and gray bars distributors of the world. Um, that's where we see products being sold through Atlona, um, Atlona products being sold as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question back on the, on the technical side asks, what is the distance limitation for HDMI over passive HDMI cables uh, for 1080p and for 4K resolutions? So uh, distance limitation, HDMI over passive HDMI cable, and they're talking yep. about 1080p and also about 4K. Yeah, so when it comes to passive HDMI cables, right, we're talking simply I want to go source to display, only using an HDMI cable, no HD-based extenders, things of that nature. Um, when it comes to 4K transmission uh, and 4K resolutions, that signal is 12 to 15 feet at a maximum. Uh, when it comes to 1080p signals, I believe that signal rolls into anywhere from um, 24 to 25 feet. Excellent. Thank you. Um, got a, a couple of questions, uh, a couple of inquiries, essentially asking the same question. And um, I'm, it refers to a specific slide that you presented. I'm going to pull up a slide. I believe it is the one. Yeah, this is the one. Um, while this slide was uh, um, was up in front of the audience, few people asked, uh, "What is that test equipment I'm looking at right there?" Yeah, so the the test equipment is that box that has the yellow around all the four corners. That is a quantum data tester. So the quantum data tester uh, analyzes; uh, it can spit out a signal and then analyze the reception of that signal. So the way this test setup works is that I would send an HDMI signal out to a set of extenders. Those extenders would plug into a cabling infrastructure, um, the 10 different ones that we have here. And then that would continue to go back into a receiver in regards uh, on the right-hand side, and then from the receiver back into that quantum data tester. And what it does is looks at the signal that was sent, looks at the signal that was received, and says, here's a comparison of uh, the frames and the pixels, have I lost anything? And if the answer is yes, then the count is one. And if the answer is no, the count is zero. Um, and it'll count each pixel individually to understand uh, the infrastructure, or if the video signal has been disrupted in any way, shape, or form. Thank you very much. Sure. Another question, um, which I'm putting in front of me right now, asks about, um, Shielded cable, which of course was was part of your presentation about the considerations for the use of shielded shielded cable. Um, if called to use shielded cable, does it matter if I use shielded jacks, um, or is it just shielded cable? What are the, you know what are the pros and cons of of 
using a shielded cable with shielded jack versus an unshielded jack. Yeah, so anytime a standard might call out for a shielded cable, um, essentially your entire channel should be a shielded application. Um, this is why when you look into a foiled cable design or a UTP cable with a foil, you kind of get around uh, maybe some of these uh, difficulties. But if you're not extending your channel end to end, um, you can, you're essentially not doing anything to benefit you in regards to using shielded. Uh, you could have voltage uh, potential differences uh, if you're essentially leaving that channel open. So you're, you're essentially eliminating the shield altogether, um, which doesn't really help you. So if you're gonna, if you're called out to use a shielded cable in an installation, um, the connector and the entire channel in and of itself should be used. Thank you very much. Um, attendee observes that the, the TV and movie industry are migrating rapidly into fiber optic options and asks if you have a comment or observation about that migration to fiber for uh, these applications. Um, so yeah, I mean, we do see uh, a transition to, especially with AV over IP and, and compression protocols to one gig transmissions running over standard category cable. Again, as you get into those military uh, applications and whatnot, uh, you'll need that higher bandwidth cable, and those band higher bandwidth cables might be uh, fiber as, as opposed to a copper connection. Um, so it's out there. Um, I would say it's not a, you know, a one-size-fits-all approach. It's meant for a very specific application. Um, by far and large, I think the majority of what you see in the marketplace is a copper category cable selection for AV over IP environments. But know that as we get into higher bandwidth applications, um, fiber becomes a suitable option uh, for that signal transmission, especially if you have to go distances beyond that 100 meters. Thanks very much. A few more for you. Thanks for hanging in there with us. I we do have some more, some more lined up for you before we're through. Um, Will uh, the LP rated cable be a better option to use uh, based on the heat generation, uh, heat generated, excuse me, from the bundle? And I wondered if, if you wouldn't mind in, in your explanation, um, Mike, if you could if you could walk uh, our audience through what what an LP cable is and, and sort of that rating, and then uh, and then address the question about uh, the possibility of it being a better option um, when uh, when bundles come into play based on heat generation. Yeah, so uh, LP listings really are, if I'm not mistaken, are generated through the uh, through a different standards body. But um, essentially, an LP listing gives you uh, a bundle requirement size uh, for different categories of cables. So if I have a, a good LP listed cable, it means that I, I can bundle that cable uh, for type 3, type 4 PoE. So... Um, in, in the case of an LP cable, uh, yes, it would be a better option uh, for you for heat dissipation and heat rise. Um, one of the things that Panduit does specifically is make sure that the cables that we offer today are, uh, do have an LP listing or an LP rating on them to make sure that they uh, fall within the appropriate standards uh, for LP listings. Don't know if that was probably the best answer, but that's the... Uh, that, that would be my understanding of it today. And we can take that one offline and get a specific answer for them as well. Excellent, thank you. Thanks very much. A uh, couple more before we wrap up. Um, are there any special considerations to bear in mind with regards to running uh, power over the same cable when you're running HD base T? And maybe that's, uh, <laughs> Maybe it feeds right back into the previous question about about LP cable, right? Because that could uh, um, that, yeah. that could we could be talking about heat rise and the like. Exactly. So when you when you look at when you look at running power through HD base T cables, um, it all comes down to right your bundle selection. How many if you're going to be running that HD base T connection through bundles of cable? Um, the the big question is is what heat rise can you take when you're bundling that cable? Um, and that's that's really the biggest consideration you would need to make. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, I'm gonna go with one more question before I do. Uh, want to let all members of the audience know that um, uh, we've got a, a queue of questions here and, and 
we're not going to be able to get to them all, but uh, again, I'm about to ask what will be the final question of, of the seminar, but please know if you have submitted a question that we um, we have captured and, and uh, retained the questions. So those that uh, those who submitted a question that, that is not being answered here verbally um, today by Mike, you, you will hear from uh, a representative of, of Panduit um, with a response to your question. So we have, uh, we have um, an overflowing till of, of, of questions here. We're not going to be able to get to them all, but please know um, that if you did submit a question, you will be receiving a response offline from this particular seminar, but your question will be answered. With that, though, uh, the final question of this seminar um, asks, is audio carried along in band with video to avoid uh, out of sync images? Um, yeah, so the in regards to, well, really in regards to AV over IP and HD base T, yes, AV, the AV signal being passed is an audio video signal. Um, so there is, you when you plug in that source to that display, um, you do get that audio c component included within it. Now, when you run those, uh, an HD base T connection or an AV over IP connection into things such as a an outside uh, speaker from, say, that display, um, say you want to use a ceiling mic or something of that nature, there are breakouts that you would use um, on those extenders to route that cable, uh, to route that signal appropriately. But if you're simply just going from a source to a display and the audio is being passed through the display, um, there, there's no issues in regards to uh, sensitivity of, or, la or latency within your audio connection. Thank you, Mike. Thanks very much for, for that answer, for all the answers, and, and uh, for all the information that, that you provided here today. Uh, sincerely appreciate it. Again, to emphasize with our audience that uh, while we're leaving some questions on the proverbial table here today, uh, you will be receiving a response to your question. So while I take like one and a half minutes here to, to babble on a little bit, if you've got a question, please send it on in because uh, because uh, uh, they will be captured, retained, and, and you'll get a response. So, so type away if you've got one. Um, but want to remind also uh, also remind members of our audience that uh, if you hold the Bixi credential, then uh, then you can use the, your attendance here today to receive a continuing education credit toward the renewal of that credential. We're about to sign off in a minute or so. When we do that, uh, you will receive an email within about one hour's time. You'll receive an email from us. The email will have a link. To your attendance certificate, your personalized attendance certificate, your name, seminar name, uh, today's date, and uh, and a code that Bixie will recognize for a CEC. So, on behalf of Cabling Installation and Maintenance, I extend a sincere thanks to today's presenter, Mike Novak, and to our sponsor, Panduit. And thanks, of course, to all of you for tuning in as well. Uh, we sincerely appreciate your attendance uh, and your interest in, in this topic. Uh, the interest certainly was. Uh, uh, was significant based on the the ebb and flow of uh, uh, or or flow and flow of of questions that we got here today. So thank you for uh, choosing us to provide this information to you, and we hope that we see you back here again soon in future webinars. Thank you once again. <laughs>